Hello, good morning, everyone. Um, welcome and welcome, ladies and gentlemen, community members, community health workers, vendors, guest speakers. I want, on behalf of the Community Engagement Corps of the Center for Biomedical and Minority Health Research, I would like to welcome everyone who joined in person and online to this seminar. Today's seminar is about creating pathway to healthy living through cooking, drinking, and eating. Before we start, I would like to share a video to describe a little bit about what is CBMHR. Texas Southern University's Center for Biomedical and Minority Health Research Community Engagement Corps is funded by the National Institute of Minority Health and Health Disparity Research Center for Minority Institutions Program. The CEC works directly with communities to identify and address health-related concerns and reduce health disparities related to ethnic minorities. We provide health education and partnerships with healthcare systems, federally qualified health centers, community and faith-based organizations. For more information, visit us on social media at CEC Texas Southern U or give us a call at 713-313-1233 or send us an email at cbmhrcommunity@tsu.edu. All right, so a little bit more about myself. My name is Dr. Ivy Poon. I am a pharmacist, a professor, and also I'm the Associate Director of Community Engagement Corps. And first of all, I want to welcome everybody joining today. Um, a little housekeeping business uh, that I would like to mention is in the folder when you check in, if you're checking in in person, you will see that there is a card. Um, on the card, you can write down your uh, questions if you have any during the presentation. And then we will have a Q&A session at the end of the presentation. If you're joining online, I would like to encourage you to click on the Q&A box if you have any questions and we'll answer all of your questions uh, during the Q&A session. Today's event will not be possible without our partners, vendors. Um, so we would like to thank you, the Don Center, for providing the space um, and also the collaboration for us to make this possible. We would also like to thank you, our sponsors, Affleck, Walmart, and Athna, for sponsoring this event to make uh, making sure that today's event is possible. So um, in the chat box, you will see there is a link. Um, when you open up the link, you will uh, be able to complete the survey for today's event. And uh, if you are a CHW, make sure that you complete the survey link before both the event and also for the CHW survey. If you are joining in person, there will be uh, a helper who will pass out the uh, survey and the survey may be included in the folder as well. Uh, we want to hear from you. We want to uh, listen to your feedback to, to tell us how we can improve. So if you have any comments, please complete your survey before you leave today's event. For the first 35 attendees who join on site, you will be eligible to receive a $15 gift card. Make sure that you complete the survey in order to receive the gift card. So today we have two presentations um, planned for. So the first presentation will be uh, presented by Dr. Alice Morrow. Dr. Morrow is an assistant professor and director of the didactic program in Dietetic of the College of Pharmacy and Health Sciences at Texas Southern University. Dr. Morrow is a member of the editorial board of the Journal of Renal Nutrition, the Diversity Inclusion Liaison of the Renal Practice Group of the Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics. 
Um, he is also an accredited an accreditation reviewer for the Accreditation Council for Education in Nutrition and Dietetics. He is also a member of the National Kidney Foundation's Health Equity Advisory Committee. His research interests include energy expenditure, obesity, and sleep apnea in chronic kidney disease. So without further delay, we welcome Dr. Morrow. Good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining us on this beautiful Saturday morning in, in Houston, Texas, and, and a little bit west of Houston, Texas, and Ailey. We want to thank the Don Center for the partnership and for hosting this very important seminar on healthy eating and improving health. Uh, as uh, doctor, I want to thank Dr. Poon for the introduction. We want to thank Chef Shona uh, for the food demonstration that she will give. Uh, in, in just a few minutes. And we, we want to uh, thank Mr. Elkins, who's on site out there in A-Leaf, making sure that you can hear us well and that the presentation comes across well. As Dr. Poon mentioned, Dr. Ellis Morrow, she, she told you everything that I'm doing. But as we begin the uh, presentation, I, I, it's important to, to realize the value and importance of nutrition and nutrition is one of the most important um, aspects of health and wellness. And eating healthy and making the best food choices is one of the most effective ways to improve your health, your wellness, your life extension, I mean, your life expectancy, and also your quality of life. So let's get into uh, the presentation as we move to our first slide. Uh, I wanted to start today talking about heart disease because heart disease is one of the leading causes of death in the United States of America. And heart disease also disproportionately affects ethnic and racial minorities in the United States of America with uh, African Americans and Latinos being at higher risk for heart disease and not just high risk for heart disease, but also higher risk for the adverse effects uh, that result from heart disease. So heart, as I mentioned, heart disease is the leading cause of death in, in, in America. According to the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, uh, the Department of Minority Health, African-Americans are 30 percent more likely to die from heart disease. And that's major. I'm not if uh, I'm not sh those of you who are there, many of us probably have someone in our family who has high blood pressure, who has heart disease, who may have congestive heart failure, who may have had a heart attack in the past, or who may have high blood cholesterol levels. And that comes in many different forms. But um, heart disease is so pervasive that all of us virtually, almost, basically all of us know someone who has heart disease or we have a form of heart disease ourselves. African-Americans are also 40% more likely to have high blood pressure. As a registered dietitian uh, with a master's degree in kinesiology uh, um, who exercises, although I eat healthy, I still have high blood pressure and it's, it's, it's related to my genetics. And it's related to the fact that my mother and my father both have high blood pressure. Now, fortunately, because I've changed the way I've eaten and I've taken my medications, my blood pressure is under control. But I do know the challenges of having high blood pressure and the realities of having high blood pressure and how pervasive high blood pressure is in the African-American and in the, in, the, in the Latino communities. Uh, and then African-Americans are less likely to control their high blood pressure. And there's many reasons for that. Uh, and some of them have to do with the foods that are available, uh, that are readily available. Some, some have to do with food deserts. Uh, some of that has to do with how we season our food. So my job as a registered dietitian, uh, one of a limited number, Currently, there are very few relative to the total number of dietitians. Only around 3% of dietitians are African-American. And then about the, a, a little bit more are Hispanic. But still, there's not a lot of resources available to um, patients and to individuals to help them be able to enjoy their diet 
in a way that respects their cultural eating habits and their cultural eating, uh, what's normal in their culture in terms of eating. And so I look forward to uh, Chef Chona's uh, uh, presentation today because uh, she's going to share with us some some ways to healthy um, to prepare foods in a healthy way. And then this is this is um, something that we don't really focus on. And it's particular for African-Americans, 60% African-American women are 60% more likely to have high blood pressure. But sometimes that goes unrecognized or maybe underdiagnosed. So as we move on to our next slide, those are some facts to think about and consider in terms of diabetes. So now, why is diet, why is diet and lifestyle so important? Why are we focusing on diet and li lifestyle? The reason is because a healthy lifestyle may, pre may prevent over 80% of deaths from heart attack. I have friends who I know died from heart attacks. They were a little bit older than me. And I have friends who had heart attacks and survived. And I have young friends uh, who have heart attacks and, and survived. Uh, but then we also know some people who are younger and had heart attacks and die. So improving your diet and improving your life, your lifestyle, increasing your physical activity um, can decrease or help prevent 80 percent of deaths from cardiac uh, from from cardiac uh, complications or heart complications. And then 72 percent of premature deaths, meaning someone dies uh, younger than what would typically be expected, up to 50% of strokes. And many of us have friends, our relatives, parents, siblings, aunts, uncles, cousins who've had a stroke. And we know the devastating effects of a stroke and how when someone has a stroke, it decreases their quality of life and it often leads to paralysis or decrease um, physical uh, abilities, diabetes and obesity. So all of these chronic diseases that disproportionately affect minorities can be improved by diet and lifestyle. As we move on to our next slide, we just want to kind of, some very simple things can be done in terms of improving the way you eat and improving your lifestyle um, factors. And one of them is just portion sizes. We we have what's called portion distortion. Some years back, maybe 20 years ago, they started supersizing everything and everything is, is large quantities. So I just want you to look in the 1960s, which was a, a while before I was born, but it will give you perspective. In the 1960s, the average um, um, fast food drink was seven point, was seven ounces about 85 calories. The average burger was around 1.6 ounces or about 120 calories. And the average French fry was 210 calories. Today, today, the average, um, the average drink, in, and that's just say 40 ounce, 48 ounces. The average drink is around 48 ounces. And that's a, in around 590 calories. And that's an increase of 500% of the calories. The average French fries is six ounces and that's uh, an increase of 250 calories. And the average burger, um, I'm sorry, so it's 32 fluid ounces, excuse my slide, there's an error on there. Uh, and eight ounces for the, for the burger. So the average burger is eight ounces and 310 calories. So if you notice, for the burger and the drink, we're up 500 calories compared to where we were in 1960. And for the French fries, we're, we've doubled the calories. And for the average person, if you add up 500 calories and 250 calories, that's 750 calories. Then I add another 450 calories. Uh, that comes right out to around 1,200, a little bit below 1,300 calories. That's all the calories we need in a whole day. And yet we'll get that in one meal. And that that's irrespective of anything else we may have eaten during the day. So one thing you can immediately do is just watch your portion sizes and decrease your portion sizes. 
uh, as we move on to our next slide. The other thing that you can do, very simple, is decrease the amount of salt you intake, you consume, and sodium. Salt and sodium increase blood pressure significantly, and there's a direct relationship between increased sodium intake and, and um, high blood pressure. So uh, one way to decrease your salt intake is to read labels. And sodium comes in different names. So some things to look at are to look for names like monosodium glutamate or MSG, sodium citrate, sodium sulfite, sodium caseinate, sodium benzoate, sodium hydroxide, disodium phosphate. These are typically added to foods and we don't really pay attention to them because when we read the label, if it doesn't say sodium or it doesn't say sodium chloride, sometimes we'll miss some of these other forms of sodium. So just pay attention to your labels, pay attention to your food labels, read your food labels, and try and choose foods that have less than 100 milligrams of sodium per serving. It will go a long way in improving your uh, lifestyle choices and your dietary choices. As we move on to our next slide, we want to talk about um, eating more fruits and vegetables. Now, um, usually I teach a class, I teach a number of classes here at TSU, and when I'm teaching on fruits and vegetables, I ask people, how many of you eat one serving or one fruit and vegetable or one serving of vegetable a day or one vegetable a day? And typically you might have half the class raise their hand. Then I'll say, how many of you eat two vegetables a day? Then you may have, it drops to around 20%. How many of you eat, then I may ask, how many of you eat three vegetables a day? And then it drops to just one or two people. The recommendations in terms of fruits and vegetables is to eat at least three, better five servings of vegetables a day, and to consume two to four servings of fruits a day. And a serving of fruits and vegetables is typically a half of a cup. And fruits and vegetables are valuable because they're high in everything good, and low in everything bad. Fruits and vegetables are high in vitamins. They're high in minerals. They're high in some, something called flavonoids, which have health benefits. They're high in fiber, which helps uh, keep you regular and helps prevent the development of hemorrhoids and in, in the long-term colon cancer. So try to eat more fruits and vegetables every day. Look at what you're doing today and then kind of take an inventory. How many servings of fruits and vegetables am I eating now? and just try to eat more. Even if you start by eating one more vegetable a day or one more fruit a day, that's a good place to start because these are live foods, these are healthy foods, these are foods that give you energy, but not only do they give you energy, they also nourish your body. As we move on to our next slide, I want us to take just a second to talk about whole grains. You, when you, the, the grains that you choose, and grains are part of our life. We we, we love grains. Uh, I know I ate my share of cornbread coming up, and I know I ate my share of rice coming up, and I used to love my mother's macaroni. So we, we, we want to enjoy these foods that we typically enjoy, but there's a way to enjoy them in a more healthy way, and that is by choosing whole grains. The reason it's important to choose whole grains is that when you have a refined grain, like a white rice, a lot of the fiber, some of the protein, and some of the vitamins and minerals have been taken out. So they take those things out. Now, they, they add them back through a process called enrichment. So enriched is better than unenriched, but it's better to get the whole grain because you're getting a more nutritionally complete grain. So as you enjoy your grains, and I know there's a whole uh, get rid of carbohydrates movement going on right now. And I'll talk a little bit about some of the problematic carbohydrates, but carbohydrates should be included as a healthy part of a diet. We just want to focus on making sure we choose whole grains as we move on to our next slide. Go easy on sugar and refined processed foods. This is probably going to be one of the most challenging things for us, especially if you live in a food desert. 
Now, if you look at the picture, these are things that you may often see in their overabundance in the grocery store. And in convenience stores, it's almost totally uh, refined processed foods and high sugar foods. When you check out of the grocery store at the front by the cash register, you have an overwhelming amount of sugar and refined processed foods. These foods, these sugary foods, these refined processed foods, high intake of these foods are associated with all of the chronic diseases, including obesity, high blood pressure, diabetes, heart disease, chronic kidney disease, and obstructive sleep apnea. These are particularly challenging. So if there's one thing that I definitely recommend that you do above all else, it, go ahead and enjoy your desserts, but just go easy on them. Don't have overconsumption on them and try to uh, eat them in ways that are healthy and then seek more healthy desserts. And, and as we go on to the next slide, um, we kind of we, we choose more healthy desserts, right? So if you see this beautiful cantaloupe, pretty nature's desserts, you see those blackberries there, those raspberry there's, you know, uh, the, uh, the, the, the um, cantaloupe is high in vitamin A, blackberries are, are very rich and they're high in fiber and, and they're high in flavonoids and these have many health benefits to them. So as you as you as you are enjoying your desserts and as you are enjoying your sweets, uh, take a move to more natural sweets. And one of the things I didn't mention on the previous slide, but in terms of fruits and vegetables, you want to get different colors because each color has a different nutritional benefit. So you want to make sure you get green vegetables and fruits. You want to get red vegetables and fruits. You want to get white vegetables and fruits. You want to get orange vegetables and fruits. You want your plate colorful, right? Because there is a unique benefit to having the, the variety of colors that vegetables come in. And as we move on to our next slide, um, limit your unhealthy fats. Now, there's a whole debate right now in nutrition about how much fat you should consume. And um, there are some recent studies that, 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 that have come out that have challenged some of the traditional ideas we held about high fat diets. But there are certain fats that in that period are not the best fats for you to consume. That would include saturated fats and saturated fats mainly come from animal products. And these saturated fats are fats like lard, butter, are foods that are high in unhealthy fats and also high in other unhealthy things like hot dogs and bacon. Not only are hot dogs and bacon high in fat and unhealthy fat, hot dogs and bacon are also high in sodium. So if you can limit these, that would be beneficial for your health. And then all the foods that may be high, like potato chips, and a lot of desserts tend to be high in unhealthy fats. Next slide, please. Now, one thing that happens when you stop using salt is food tends to get bland. The reason it gets bland because we're used to tasting salt and our taste buds are used to salt. So when I take salt out, it seems like the food is bland. If you can go a while without using salt, you can actually taste the food because food has a taste and food tastes good, but often that's hidden by salt. However, we want you to eat, we want you to be happy. So there are a number of seasonings and spices that you can use instead of salt. And if you just look up here, 5, 10, 15, 20, 25, 28 different spices that you can use instead of salt, and you can pull up through a, a simple Google search, what are what are what's good to use these spices in? Like, so what saffron goes well? With? What does black pepper go well with? What does turmeric and ginger and cloves and paprika? And you will notice that the more you spice your foods, the better they're going to taste. And you can have tasty, delicious, flavorful foods without the sodium if you use spices. 
And there's actually something called Mrs. Dash, which for the most part has no um, uh, salt in it. All of them, all Miss Dash's seasonings have no salt in them in a bunch of different times. So as we move toward the end of our presentation, we have just one or two more slides left. So our next slide, you want to consume low fat dairy foods. Now, I know for a lot of minorities, especially for African-Americans, there may be a lot of lactose intolerance, but dairy foods are healthy and they should be included as part of a healthy diet, um, particularly lower fat because the fat that's in dairy products are um, saturated fats. However, you want to work with a nutritionist because there may be some value to um having different levels of fats in your dairy products. So that's a general guideline. And dairy products are also a good source of calcium. Next slide. Okay, so in summary, this is the take home message. Limit your salt sodium, limit your sugar and refined processed foods, enjoy whole grains, fruits, vegetables, lean meats, proteins, and beans, low fat dairy products, and also enjoy your cultural foods. Try to get physical physical exercise as much as you can, and there's some basic limits. But whatever you're doing today, do a little bit more walking, gardening, dancing, whatever. Thank you all for your time. I, there's a question and session, uh, 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 a question and answer session later. But I want to thank you for your time. I want to thank you for joining us this morning. Well, thank you so much, um, Dr. Morrow, for giving us such invaluable um, information. As I was listening, I'm doing a little self-reflection myself, and I'm sure every one of us can wait to put these advices into our practice. So next, we have uh, a chef uh, to do a demonstration for us. We are so excited to have uh, Shauna Jefferson. She's the owner and executive chef. And uh, Shauna Jefferson began her cul cul culinary career at the tender age of 11 years old by helping her dad at the local Houston restaurant. After spending many years in business and as a practicing attorney, she returned to her culinary roots by managing the family restaurant for a few years while obtaining a degree in culinary arts from the St. Jacinto College. Shauna has always been interested in giving back to others because to whom much is given, much is required. As a chef for senior owner and personal chef, give her an opportunity to do well by doing good and to combine her love of people, business, and culinary art. Uh, she and her team and talent chefs serve the North and Southeast Houston metro area seniors. She attended the University of Texas at Austin and received a BBA in finance and a Bachelor of Art in Plan to Honor Liberal Art Program. She also has a law degree from uh, Georgia State University College of Law. And at this time, we welcome Chef uh, Shona to come to the to the screen. So I'm going to stop share so you can see her in the full screen. Let me know if you cannot. Hi, good morning, everyone. Can everyone see me and hear me? I can. Okay, great. So uh, Chef Shauna Jefferson here, and I'm here today to show you how to make cornmeal crust cornmeal crusted catfish with tomato sauce. And I think this is a great dish because uh, so many of us love our fried fish, whether it be catfish, whether it be tilapia, cod, um, we just love fried fish. But um, as Dr. Barrow previously stated, all of the fried foods are not healthy for us. So I'm gonna show you a healthier alternative to, to still satisfy your fried fish taste buds without the added um, saturated um, fats. So I'm gonna go through the ingredients here really quickly and I'm actually going to adjust my camera downward 
So hopefully you can see um, what I'm doing. All right, so uh, for the sauce, we're gonna start with some olive oil and onion, some grated carrot, some minced garlic, eight ounces of no salt added tomato sauce, some chopped fresh parsley, and then some dried oregano, a dash of cinnamon, a dash of paprika, and some cr uh, crushed red pepper flakes. And then for our fish, we're gonna have low fat buttermilk, some grated lemon zest to add a little zing and extra flavor, some freshly ground black pepper, some yellow cornmeal, some jalapeno pepper also to add a little zing and extra flavor. And I've discarded the seeds and the ribs from the jalapeno pepper because that's actually where the heat is found. And so I know a lot of people have sensitivity to spice. So if you uh, discard the seeds and cut out the white ribs, you're left with the green part of the pepper, which is still going to give you a little spot, a little spice, but not a whole lot of heat. And then we are going to add a little bit of salt. And of course, the catfish fillets. And then I'm going to use some olive oil spray. So we're going to get started by an medium and have pre done some of this for us in the interest of time. So I've already sauteed the onions, the garlic, and the carrots. And then all we're going to do next is add the tomato sauce. And one note that um, Dr. Morrow mentioned before is about added sodium. So reading your labels, you definitely wanna read your labels. So for example, this is a can of uh, regular tomato sauce and the amount of sodium in a serving size, which is a quarter cup, is 260 milligrams of sodium, which is 11% of your daily value of, of sodium. But this no salt added tomato sauce only has 10 milligrams of added sodium. So you see there's a huge difference between buying uh, tomato sauce, vegetables, pan vegetables that are have salt added versus those that have no salt added. So I've added my no salt added tomato sauce and then we're gonna add our parsley and our seasoning mix. And then we're just gonna mix this together. And then I'm gonna put this back on the stove and we're gonna let this simmer for about 15 to 20 minutes. Okay, so while that is simmering, we're gonna prepare our fish. So I preheated the oven to 450 degrees. And what we're gonna do now is I'm gonna is spray a sheet pan that's a parchment paper on the sheet pan. Spray it with a little olive oil spray. And then I've got my fish. And first, I've got my buttermilk in one container, and I'm going to add my cornmeal, my lemon zest, jalapenos. pepper, and a little bit of salt. And we're going to mix this together. So see, we've got our cornmeal mix. Then we're going to dredge our fish. So whenever you're dredging fish, and you're using a battering station, this is what I call it, you'll have a wet hand and a dry hand so things don't get all mess messy. So this is my wet hand. Gonna coat the fish in the buttermilk. And then we're gonna press it into the cornmeal and I'm using my dry hand. 
to do that. I'm gonna remove the excess cornmeal and add it to the sheet pan. Then I'm gonna take another piece. And the recipe calls for basically a pound of catfish, so four four ounce fillets. So press it in the cornmeal. And for illustrative purposes this morning, in the interest of time, I'm just gonna do two. So I've added those to my, wash the gunk off of my hands. So I've added these to the sheet pan, and then we're gonna spray them with a little more olive oil spray. Then we're gonna put them in the oven and bake them for about 15 to 20 minutes until the top is nice and crisp and the fish flakes easily when tested with the floor. So of course, I've, in the interest of time, I've pre-made some fish here. So you see how nice and crisp and uh, flaky and crust and uh, nice, nice crispy crust on it. And then I have the tomato sauce, which I've also pre-made here. And then you're just gonna drizzle about two tablespoons of sauce on each piece of fish. And this is also a great alternative for those of us who love to use cocktail sauce or ketchup on our fish, which also tend to have a lot of added sugars and salt. So this is a healthy alternative with lots of vegetables in it, with your onions, your garlic, and your carrots. And so there we have it, cornmeal coated catfish with tomato sauce. So thank you so much for joining me this morning for this uh, food demonstration and I'll stick around towards the end uh, in case any of you have any questions for me. Thanks so much. Thank you so much, Chef Shauna, for sharing your tips in cooking. Um, so at this moment, we will answer any questions that anyone may have. Um, so maybe we can first uh, see uh, maybe the in-person audience. Do you have any questions? And if Virgil can help us to facilitate that. Okay. So I do I do not hear anything, so I assume that there is no question. Uh, we don't yeah. have any questions at the time. No? Okay, good. So um, I see a question in the Q&A box. And... Um, Actually, Dr. Poon, I'm sorry, we, we do have a question. Oh, you do? Okay, yes, go ahead. Could you go over again how that tomato sauce um, was made? Chef, please. Okay, sure. Sure. So you're going to saute your onions, your grated carrot, and your minced garlic. And you want to saute them till your onions are translucent and, uh, and pretty soft. And then you're going to add one eight ounce can of the no salt added tomato sauce, the parsley, your dried spices. So that's your oregano, a dash of cinnamon, a dash of paprika and your crushed red pepper flakes. If you're sensitive to spice, feel free to leave out the crushed red pepper flakes. And you'll saute all of your vegetables first together, like I mentioned, then you're gonna add the other ingredients, your tomato sauce, and then you're gonna let that simmer on the stove uh, for about 20 minutes until the spices and the tomato sauce are nicely combined with your, with your vegetables. So I uh, have question more uh, for acidez. The acidez, uh, how how you low the acidez for the tomato? 
Okay, great question. Great question. So for those people who suffer from acid reflux or GERD, uh, one of the things that you can do is you can buy a can of something called San Marzano tomatoes. And San Marzano tomatoes, you can actually get them crushed or you can get them whole in the can and crush them yourselves. And there's something about the um, chemical makeup of the San Marzano tomatoes that uh, make them much, much, much more palatable for people who do suffer from acid reflux. And I've tested it here at home on my mom and on uh, many of my clients who have acid reflux and they handle the San Marzano tomatoes very well. So you can find those in the canned food section of your uh, local grocery store. And they're called San Marzano, S-A-N-M-A-R-Z-A-N-O tomatoes. Okay, Dr. Poon, we are all good here in person. And I don't see any questions online, so we'll give it back to you. All right. So, yeah. So there is actually a question online, um, but it has it is related to a previous event. But uh, I just want to let you know that we do receive your questions, so we'll follow up with you uh, through email. Thank you for your comment. Um well, if there is no more question, I just have a few more announcements. Then let me share my screen and okay. Hold on a second. Okay. All right, so we are through with the questions and answer. And uh, so as a reminder, please complete your survey before you leave and let us know if any feedback and so that we can improve our program. If you are CHW, please complete the CHW survey. And there are a couple of upcoming events that we would like to announce. And we, our next event is on December the 2nd on Saturday. And it's in person and it's gonna be about childhood cancer, what the community needs to know. And at that time, we will have an educational presentation as well. And we are also giving out a $15 lunch gift cards available for the first 35 eligible in-person attendee. We want you to save the date for the maternal and child health event that is upcoming in on January the 26th in 2024. Uh, save that day if you are interested. This is a very exciting event that we will have guest speaker, panelists, and super exciting. This is a list of our um, future events. So we have events planned all the way until May. So um, if you're interested in any of these events, connect with us through the um, Facebook or social media. And we uh, really appreciate that you attend today's event. And uh, so we are concluding this presentation. We want to say thank you very much for attending. Thank you for Dr. Morrow and Chef Shauna for um, sharing with us the tips. Uh, we wish everybody have a wonderful Saturday.